The subcommittee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on judicial ethics and transparency, the limits of existing statutes and rules. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. And if you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I would also ask all members to mute your microphones when you're not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues, and you may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I would also ask that all members who direct questions to Mr. Hetler Godet, who is, our, who is on our first panel of witnesses, uh, to please identify yourself when asking a question. Also, if you use any kind of visual aid during your remarks or while you are asking questions to Mr. Hedler Gaudet. Please describe that visual. And finally, I would like to add that Professor Green must leave by 4.45 p.m., so please prioritize your questions to Professor Green to the extent necessary. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good afternoon and welcome uh, witnesses to uh, today's hearing. I didn't have a chance to greet uh, you all personally before the hearing, but uh, please accept this as my humble uh, offer. Uh, and uh, we are here today to explore and to consider disturbing facts that have been brought to light by recent reporting about the failure of federal judges to recuse themselves in cases where they or their family held a financial interest. We will also examine how the, law, how the laws and rules currently on the books have fallen short and failed to prevent the circumstances exposed in that reporting. Central to our discussion today will be the appearance of impropriety and the appearance of impartiality, which is an essential component of our constitutional system of justice. Justice John Marshall Harlan, the great dissenter, said that, quote, the appearance of even-handed justice is at the core of due process, end quote. Appearances matter. It is in the appearance of impartiality that Americans find faith in their courts and trust in their democracy. That is one reason why the recent reports from the Wall Street Journal exposing numerous instances where judges' decisions have appeared to be biased or partial or improperly influenced by their financial interests are so disheartening. The damage has been done. Federal judges do not, did not follow the law. We do not know whether any judge specifically acted to benefit his or her ownership interests, but the appearance of impropriety has already tainted their judgments. Notwithstanding any actual undue influence, the fact that the 130 plus judges profiled in the journal appear as if they might have acted with their pecuniary interest in mind is enough to shake the public's confidence in the United States judiciary. This is especially frustrating because the judges at the center of this expose failed to meet the very modest demands placed on them by their lifetime tenure in the federal courts. The executive and legislative branches are subject to extensive and frequent financial reporting requirements, as well as strict ethical rules on matters in which they have a financial interest. For judges, the bar is much lower. Judges need only disclose limited information about their finances once a year, and then recuse themselves from any cases in which they have a financial interest. The recusal is critical, and the recusal is where these judges broke the law. The Supreme Court has described the statutory requirement for judicial recusal as, quote, steps necessary to maintain public confidence in the impartiality of the judiciary, end quote. And yet, what the Wall Street Journal has shown us 
are judges deciding cases while being part owners of the parties in front of them, trading and profiting on trades of shares of those parties, and in at least one instance, making a ruling in favor of those parties, which was later overturned on appeal. These failures to recuse were not isolated cases, nor were they limited to individual judges. The journal reported on 131 federal judges participating in, three, in 685 cases in which they had a financial interest. 61 judges actively traded stocks in the companies before them while their cases were pending. Fully one-fifth of the judges who had disclosed a financial interest decided a case in which that interest was implicated. One-fifth. And these concerns were not limited to the lower courts. The Supreme Court is not bound by a code of ethics to protect its members from the appearance of impropriety, which was the subject of litigation of legislation I introduced last Congress and which I plan on reintroducing soon. Today, we learn more about what Congress can do to make sure that members of our judiciary take the steps necessary to avoid violating the recusal statute and the troubling appearances of impro impropriety that result. I'm proud to join my esteemed colleague, Ms. Ross, in introducing the Courthouse, Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act, which would address head on many of these lapses in regulation surfaced by the journal's re reporting. These reforms are critical to maintaining the public's confidence in the decisions and in the authority of the courts. And that brings us to our distinguished panelist. Our first panel is comprised of experts and advocates in the fields of judicial ethics and transparency and constitutional law who will enlighten us on the legal and constitutional issues involved in restoring and maintaining the strength of the federal judiciary, particularly the public's perception of judges' legitimacy and impartiality. We will then be joined by a member of the federal judiciary and a leader in the judicial conference, the body that is responsible for guiding and assisting judges in the satisfaction of their statutory responsibilities. Thank you, and I look forward to your testimony, and it is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is somewhat less frequent than I'd like for members here on the dais to be in total agreement. Perhaps it is not surprising that we're in total agreement about what another branch of government should do. But just a few years ago, we came to an agreement on a bipartisan and bicameral basis on what came to be known as the Stock Act. The fact is, we recognized that the ownership, either by ourselves or our family members and or the trading, needed to be not only eventually uh, disclosed, but disclosed publicly in real time. That disclosure has given the public an opportunity to have greater confidence that what a member is doing uh, is in fact uh, consistent with what they own and vice versa, that trades made on what might be inside information are in fact discovered in a reasonable period of time. The public believes that which is made public is in fact that which keeps the private from inappropriately dealing. That is what we're discussing here today. It is likely to be uh, as the chairman said, a subject of real legislation to bind the Article III, the third branch, to substantially the same rules as the other two branches are bound to. Some might say that the independence of the judiciary would be tarnished or in some way limited by Congress mandating these rules for Article III. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is that that which the judicial branch has not done for itself, it does so at the peril of its legitimacy and the 
regaining of the legitimacy by the federal court system requires not only that the judges, but all the other key staff, just as in the House, just as in the Senate, just as in the executive branch, that have access to inside information and might very well trade on it, be open and transparent. Anything less, I believe, will in fact affect us adversely. There is a, a, a statement that we, we all heard, and we heard the chairman announce it, that it is the requirement of a judge to recuse himself. I disagree with that standard. I disagree with that standard vehemently. It is, in fact, the judge's responsibility to do so, and if the judge does not do so, it is the right of the American people to insist, based on public disclosure, that the questioning of a judge be done proactively, in real time, in a way that would, in fact, allow a, a, what could be a long, expensive, laborious, and even capital decision to be made by an independent judge. You cannot unring a bell and you cannot get an impartial hearing by a judge. Even if it is done a second time, there is considerable damage. So, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for holding uh, this hearing. Uh, I am obviously predicting that we will act uh, and that it is likely that we will act consistent with the Stock Act and other transparency rules that the other branches live under. And I thank the chairman again for holding this hearing and agree completely with his opening statement, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for California from, his, from California for his remarks. And next, I will recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Issa for holding this important hearing today. The federal judiciary is a pillar of our nation's government, an institution nearly synonymous with upholding the rule of law. When Congress, as a co-equal branch, conducts oversight of the courts with hearings such as this one, it is, with the goal, it is with the following goal in mind, to promote and protect this vital institution in order to safeguard judicial independence and maintain public confidence in our courts. Our federal judiciary is the envy of the world, and Congress has a clear interest in ensuring that this hard-earned reputation is maintained. Today's hearing is a necessary part of that process. As mentioned by the chairman and ranking member, an investigation by a team of journalists at the Wall Street Journal found that at least 131 federal judges appear to have unlawfully and unethically failed to recuse themselves from cases in which they and their families had a financial interest. Many judges even actively traded shares in the companies that were appearing before them as litigants. What the journal uncovered appears to constitute a massive failure of not just individual justice judges, but of the entire system that is ostensibly in place to prevent this unlawful conduct. Troublingly, many judges simply refused to comment on their apparent violations of the recusal and ethics laws. Others blamed their clerks, their conflict checking software, or even the litigants themselves. Other judges, however, were clearly aghast that they had missed the financial conflict of interest and welcomed the opportunity to try to make things right. One judge put it best when he said, I just blew it. I regret any question that I've created an appearance of impropriety or a conflict of interest. He should be credited for his candor because it reflects exactly the kind of integrity and clear-sightedness that make for an exceptional judge. But with a problem that seems to be this widespread, it would be wrong to single out any one judge. To its credit, the administrative of the courts said that it took the matter seriously, but it's clear that the safeguards in place to prevent this kind of misconduct are simply not, not up to the task. I hope the revelations uncovered by the Wall Street Journal's reporting will spark a thorough re-examination of these safeguards, especially since some of the weaknesses in the current system were already well known. Two years ago, this subcommittee held a hearing on judicial ethics and transparency that seems to have foretold many of the problems that the Wall Street Journal's reporting has brought to light. At that hearing, our distinguished witnesses told us that Congress should require that judges' financial disclosure forms, which are necessary to detect potential conflicts of interest, be made publicly available 
on a searchable online database. Our witnesses recommended that judges should be required to make the recusals publicly available, along with their reasons for recusing. Our witnesses told us that attorneys were afraid to ask a judge to recuse themselves and recommended that recusal motions should be decided by a different judge or panel of judges. Our witnesses told us that the judiciary's decisions regarding ethics and recusal must be made transparently and fairly. Our witnesses also made clear that Congress has an obligation to act when the judiciary's self-regulating efforts fall short. Last Congress, I joined Chairman Johnson and Representative Quigley in introducing the 21st Century Courts Act, which included a range of reforms to the laws governing judicial ethics, recusal, and transparency. Many of the provisions in our bill drew from the Judiciary Room Act, which Ranking Member Issa championed when he was chair of the subcommittee and which passed this committee overwhelmingly. The Wall Street Journal's investigation and other events have made clear that those reforms are not only sorely overdue, but that they must be strengthened. I am hopeful that today's distinguished witnesses will provide us with excellent suggestions on what reforms to include in an updated version of the 21st Century Courts Act, which we plan on reintroducing soon. I look forward to their testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from New York, and uh, we will now I'll turn to our witnesses for their testimony. We will have two panels of witnesses uh, at today's hearing. The first is a panel of experts on judicial ethics and constitutional law. The second is a member of the judiciary. And I will now introduce the first panel of witnesses, but not before I uh, remind members that the guidance from the at attending physician states that face coverings are required all meetings in an enclosed space, such as committee hearings, except when you are recognized to speak. And I'd ask my uh, colleagues to comply with that rule. And uh, I'll turn now to introducing the witnesses. Professor Renee Nake Jefferson holds the Larry Doherty Chair in Legal Ethics at the University of Houston Law Center. Professor Jefferson has been recognized both in the United States and abroad as an expert on professional responsibility and legal ethics. She regularly assists in legal matters involving judicial ethics and has testified before the Texas Supreme Court of Review on this issue. Professor Jefferson earned her BA in communications from North, Port, North Park College in Chicago, Illinois, and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Welcome, Professor Jefferson. Dylan Hetler Gaudet is a government affairs manager at Project on Government Oversight, where he champions good government policy solutions such as judicial ethics and transparency. Mr. Hetler Gaudet is an expert on both judicial ethics and institutional reform, and his work is frequently cited in popular nationwide news outlets. Mr. Hetler Gaudet has his undergraduate degree in political science and economics from the University of Southern Maine, and his master's in international relations from Northeastern University. Welcome, Mr. Hetler Gaudet. Professor Thomas Morgan teaches professional responsibility and antitrust law at George Washington Law School. Professor Morgan has published numerous articles on professional responsibility and legal ethics. Before teaching at GW Law, Professor Morgan served as dean of the Emory University School of Law and as a president of the Association of American Law Schools. Professor Morgan has his BA from Northwestern University and J.D. from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Professor Morgan. Professor Jamal Green is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He specializes in constitutional law, constitutional theory, and the federal courts. Professor Green authored a book released earlier this year and has written numerous law review articles in publications such as the Harvard Law Review and Columbia Law Review. His non-academic work has been featured in many national publications. Before joining academia, Professor Green served as a law clerk to Judge Guido Calabresi 
on the Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and to Judge John Paul's Justice John Paul Stevens on the United States Supreme Court. Professor Green has a BA from Harvard College and a JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, Professor Green. Before proceeding with your testimony, I hereby remind each witness that all of your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalties of perjury pursuant to 18 U.S.C. Section 1001, which may result in the imposition of a fine or imprisonment of up to five years or both should one suffer a conviction. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety and accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it means that your five minutes have, have expired. Professor Jefferson, uh, you may begin. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and members of this subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify. I am a law professor from the University of Houston, where I hold the Doherty Chair in Legal Ethics. I've written numerous books and articles on the topic of judicial ethics, and so it is indeed my distinct honor to appear before you today. My goal is to make the case for a change in the culture of the federal judiciary, shifting from a culture of silence to a culture of compliance. My testimony has two parts. First, I'll start by addressing the recent Wall Street Journal investigation documenting that federal judges presided over hundreds of cases for more than almost a decade involving companies in which they or their family members owned stock. This violation of federal law 28 U.S.C. section 455 is troubling indeed, but I actually believe that it's emblematic of larger issues. And second, I'll turn to reforms. My written testimony contains a significant detail about the legislative history of section 455. The short story, Congress clearly intended to create a bright line rule mandating that a federal judge recuse or step away from hearing a case if they have a financial interest in a party. So why are judges doing this if the law forbids it? We know from the Wall Street Journal reporting that many were unfamiliar with the rule, some believed it didn't apply to their financial holdings, others blamed a clerical error. And viewed in isolation, each judge's response might be understandable, especially those who made an innocent mistake. But viewed in the aggregate, we can reach no other conclusion than the system is broken. And that leads me to the second part of my testimony, reforms. Let me highlight what I've submitted to you in my written statement. First, consider the goals of recusal. One, recusal prevents actual bias against the parties in a proceeding so that it's fair. And second, Recusal protects against the appearance of bias, which preserves the public confidence in the judiciary. Now, Section 455 is both under and over-inclusive in accomplishing these goals, and that this bright line rule does risk disqualifying a judge who would not, by any objective standard, be biased because they hold a trivial amount of stock. But it also doesn't encompass other financial interests that are likely or may very well sway a judge. At a minimum, the law should be revised to cover any interest that depends on the financial situation of a party in the matter. And federal judges should comply with the same reporting requirements that members of Congress and other federal officials do about their financial holdings. Second, we shouldn't have to rely on journalists for the enforcement of judicial ethics, although certainly we should welcome investigations like the Wall Street Journal's reporting, but I believe the federal judiciary must itself lead in enforcing its own legal and ethical obligations, and Congress can and should take steps to encourage and demand this accountability, which brings me to my next point. A rule on the books is easily ignored if there's no consequence for its violation, as is the case here. Recusal decisions should be reviewed by other judges, and transparent, aggregated data about recusals made easily available to the public at no cost would be a powerful enforcement tool. So would a public list of judges who fail to comply with the law. 
Access to this sort of information facilitates prevention through accountability and through education. Finally, the culture of silence must be replaced with a culture of compliance. Federal judges are intimidating. Parties may be reluctant to request recusal. A March 2020 letter by this House committee documented the power dynamics that thwarted sexual misconduct reporting within the federal judiciary. And those same power dynamics have fostered a culture of silence around judicial recusal. Another vital step is to extend that culture of compliance to the United States Supreme Court. Because the court has declined to adopt an ethics code for itself, Congress should support legislation calling for it to do so. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Hetler Gaudet, you may begin, sir. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have one uh, quick request, please. If someone could orally let me know when I reached the point where the light would be switching to a different color. Um, that's a wonderful invention, but it's not very useful for me, and I want to make sure I stay within the five-minute uh, parameters. I will, and uh, if you'll hold on a second, we'll reset the reset. clock, and, uh, and I'll let you know when uh, one minute uh, is remaining. Thank you. And you may now begin. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Dylan hetler Godet, and I am the Government Affairs Manager for the Project on Government Oversight, more commonly known as POGO. I want to first start by commending the committee for holding this important hearing on this important topic. The North Star of my testimony today will be the need to ensure the legitimacy, the independence, and the integrity of the federal judiciary by promoting common sense, reasonable reforms. As one of the three branches of government in our constitutional structure, it is absolutely essential that the federal judiciary be accountable and transparent in practice, but also that it be perceived to be accountable and transparent by the public. You see, the courts have no army with which to enforce their rulings, and they do not control key levers of power, such as the power of the purse and the power to declare war. What they do have is their legal and moral authority. That authority is predicated on foundational public assumptions of impartiality, high ethical standards, and good judgment. When any of these prerequisite characteristics are lacking, either in reality or in perception, the entire edifice of the judiciary and of the rule of law is fundamentally weakened. This is why it was so troubling to see a recent Wall Street Journal report in which we found out that more than 130 federal judges had ruled on cases in which either they or members of their family had a financial interest, which represents a grave violation of existing laws around judicial disqualification, and also a grave violation of core principles contained within the canons of judicial ethics. Even more importantly, what these revelations did is they, they exacerbated and fed into pre-existing public perceptions about the fundamental corruption of the federal government, which includes the federal courts. I want to pause here for a moment to note that while these Wall Street Journal revelations were shocking, they were not especially new. For years now, we have seen reports coming out of the judiciary about various kinds of misconduct, real and perceived, ranging from suspicious stock ownership and travel by Supreme Court justices, to sexual harassment and other kinds of workplace malfeasance being perpetrated by federal judges across the country. One of the key reasons why these, these instances keep cropping up is because the judicial branch on the whole is the least transparent and least accountable branch of government. Take, for example, financial disclosures. It is extremely difficult and time consuming to access financial disclosures that have been filed by federal judges. Relatedly, federal judges are not required to file periodic transaction reports when they engage in a securities transaction, such as a stock trade, despite the fact that members of Congress and executive branch officials are required to file such reports. These transparency and disclosure requirements are designed to promote high ethical standards and prevent malfeasance like insider trading on the part of individuals within government who have access to the types of non-public information that the rest of us do not have. 
I think it is fair to say that federal judges most certainly have access to this kind of information. This lack of transparency and the impunity that flows from it represents an existence or risk to the overall legitimacy of the judicial branch. As I mentioned at the outset of my testimony, it is that legitimacy that allows the courts to play the vital role that they must within our constitutional scheme. Each time a new report surfaces that calls into question the impartiality and the ethicality of a federal judge, one more crippling blow has been dealt to that legitimacy. Now, there are many ideas percolating out there about how to address these challenges, but I want to focus on two relatively narrow ones here that would specifically address the issues raised by the Wall Street Journal report. One minute. First, all federal judges should be required to file periodic transaction reports when they engage in a securities transaction, such as a stock trade. Second, all financial disclosure documents filed by federal judges should be posted online and made easily, and made easily accessible to the public. These reforms would not be a silver bullet. They would not fix all of the challenges plaguing the federal judiciary. They would, however, make the courts more transparent. That enhanced transparency would allow judges themselves and people with business before the courts to spot potential conflicts of interest and pursue accountability avenues as appropriate. Thank you for providing me space to share some thoughts today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hedler Gordet. Uh, next, Professor Morgan and members, we uh, understand votes have been called, but we'll get through the uh, testimony and then we will uh, recess for votes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Morgan, you're recognized. Uh, and, uh, and sir, please unmute. Chairman Johnson, I apologize. Ranking Member Issa, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I offer uh, the subcommittee uh, what I believe is a bit more positive news. First, the problem uh, documented by the Wall Street Journal is one that people of all political persuasions should agree needs solution. Second, in my opinion, the solution does not have to be particularly complicated or costly. What the solution will require first and foremost is that the judiciary focus on the fact that it has a real problem and that it must take the lead in proposing and implementing solutions. Solving the problem should not be difficult. Every day all over the country, American law firms of even moderate size undertake to determine whether they may or may not represent a potential new client consistent with the ethical rules against conflict of interest. Basically what they have to do is compare the present and past clients of the law firm against the name of the new potential new client and uh, the uh, persons against which that uh, client wants to proceed. Nobody can keep that information solely in their head. So law firms, uh, all of which have basically the same problem, have stimulated the production of a whole variety of software that can uh, make the necessary comparisons. I recognize that the legal issues related to judicial recuse are different from attorney conflict of interest and law firm technology would require uh, adaptation. But I suggest that the, the objective of both systems and the methodology for finding the right answers is likely to be substantially the same. The Judicial Conference of the United States is well aware of this software, of course, and has instructed judges to use it. The results of the Wall Street Journal survey, however, suggest that the operation of the system today falls well short in practice. I would urge you to consider this system uh, this way. Cases are normally assigned to judges only after passing through a court clerk's office. I suggest it should be at that point of entry 
that named parties in a case should be compared to the names of the companies in the judges uh, of, of which judges in the judicial district or circuit have a financial interest as shown on filings submitted by those judges. The fact that most cases today are filed electronically should make this software assisted comparison even easier. Only judges cleared as not required to recuse themselves should even be eligible for initial assignment to hear a case. The judges to whom a case is assigned should then have ultimate responsibility to do a final verification and an ongoing verification of uh, their eligibility to hear the case. The buck stops under the law with the judge, but he or she should have maximum help handling the system, the process right. Such a system can only be as good as the information uh, you have on the judge's financial records uh, or interests. And I agree with the witnesses that have said that uh, you ought to require a uh, timely, uh, quick uh, reporting of any such transactions. Uh, but in, to summarize what I'm uh, suggesting to the subcommittee, that is that you should support efforts to help judges comply with the recusal rule rather than simply looking for broad scale uh, solutions that perhaps suggest uh, much more uh, uh, wrongdoing that in fact has occurred. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee and I look forward to responding to your question. Thank you, Professor Morgan. Uh, we will now recognize Professor Green for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa and distinguished committee members. I'm the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School where I teach and write in the areas of constitutional law and comparative constitutional law. I'm not an expert in judicial ethics, uh, but I have studied a number of questions around regulation of federal courts. Congress has significant authority to apply ethics and disqualification rules to lower federal court judges, and it has used that authority for ages. My testimony addresses the constitutionality of applying a code of judicial conduct and or disqualification rules to justices of the Supreme Court and enforcing such a code and such rules against them. I conclude that this, that Congress has broad constitutional authority to provide that ethics rules apply to Supreme Court justices, but that apart from impeachment, uh, remedies for violating such rules may require that the court itself sit atop the chain of enforcement. My testimony does not address whether assuming its constitutionality, applying a code of conduct to the Supreme Court is necessary, is wise, or if so, what form it, it should ideally take. Before addressing the merits, it's important to make a preliminary point about the nature of the constitutional interpretive question. Some constitutional questions are best answered by direct reference to the text of the Constitution. Others are best answered by reference to the prior opinions of the Supreme Court. But whether and how Congress may subject Supreme Court justices or indeed other federal court judges to ethical rules lends itself neither to interpretation via specific textual commands nor interpretation via judicial precedents. With limited exceptions, the text of the Constitution does not specify the ways in which Congress may regulate the behavior of Supreme Court justices. Likewise, prior judicial precedents offer no specific guidance on the question of whether and how Congress may regulate the ethics of Supreme Court justices. In the separation of powers area, government lawyers, scholars, courts, all have relied heavily on historical practice to work out the division of power between the different branches of government. This also means that the, judici the judiciary is not the sole source of interpretive wisdom around this set of questions. The considered view of Congress reflected in legislation bears significant interpretive weight, and it always has. It is neither necessary nor appropriate to understand congressional power in this area solely or even pri primarily through a prediction about how the current or a future Supreme Court would answer a particular question. In this area, as in many others, members of the legislature must reach their own judgments about what the Constitution permits. 
any discussion of the power of Congress to regulate the behavior of Supreme Court justices involves a two-pronged inquiry. There is an initial question of whether Congress has the power to impose rules of conduct on justices of the Supreme Court. And there's a second and distinct question of what enforcement mechanisms Congress has the constitutional power to impose. On the first question, Congress has broad power to regulate the ethical practices of justices. The constitutional source of that power is the Necessary and Proper Clause, which has been read to give Congress broad power to order the Supreme Court's affairs. Congress has used this power to require Supreme Court justices to sit on lower federal courts, to set the size of the court, to impose quorum rules on the court, to define its term, to provide for the Supreme Court's building and staff, to assign a wide variety of roles to the Chief Justice of the United States, and to provide for a pension and seniority system that extends to Supreme Court justices. Since 1948, Congress has used its necessary and proper clause power specifically to impose ethics requirements on Supreme Court justices. Justices are required to swear a specific oath or affirmation, wherein they pledge to, quote, do equal right to the poor and to the rich and to act impartially. They are subject to a criminal prohibition on the practice of law. They're subject to disqualification and financial disclosure rules, and there are statutory limits on their outside income. These rules have not been enforced in the past against Supreme Court justices, but the structure of enforcement raises separate and distinct issues. The main constraint on enforcement is that current ethical rules applicable to federal judges rely on adjudication by these judges themselves. There's a strong argument that lower federal court judges cannot sit in ultimate judgment over the Supreme Court, which is a constitutionally superior body. The two most promising responses to this problem are either to have the court itself adjudicate ethics complaints or disqualification motions involving its members, or to have the court sit as an appellate body over such complaints and motions after they are adjudicated by lower court judges. I look forward to the committee's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Green. At this time, we will now recess for votes. I expect that we should be back in this room ready to uh, com uh, commence this hearing again at about 3.30. So I want to thank the witnesses for their forbearance and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in about 45 minutes. Thank you.
This committee meeting is uh, called back to order. I'd ask the witnesses uh, who are remote uh, to uh, open up your video line. And uh, we will now begin with questions and I will proceed under the five minute rule. And I recognize myself for five minutes. During the period the journal analyzed, one in five federal judges who disclosed holdings of any individual stocks unlawfully heard at least one case involving the companies whose shares that they owned, 20%. Mr. Hedler Gaudet, do you, those statistics surprise you? And if so, why do you think that the issue is so prevalent? Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Uh, those statistics do not surprise me, and um, they should not surprise anyone who has been watching and observing the federal courts uh, for any length of time. I mentioned in my, uh, in my oral testimony that uh, the federal judiciary is the least transparent branch of government, and um, it is not surprising that with that lack of transparency, we see violations of laws and protocols and rules. Um, uh, we've seen these kinds of reports before, too. Um, there have, there is recently an article in the um, North Carolina Law Review that uh, raised up some of these same issues and pointed to similar statistics. Um, in 2014, the Center for Public Integrity did a very good investigative deep dive into this exact issue, and they found that a couple, that 26 more judges had uh, ruled on cases that they had a financial conflict of interest in. So this is a long-standing and persistent issue. And um, I think it really, you know, it speaks to the need to pursue reforms that would enhance and strengthen the, the integrity and the legitimacy of the courts. And the way you do that is by ensuring that the public has faith and trust in the impartiality of federal judges. And I think that faith and trust is fundamentally compromised and undermined as we see these reports continuously, Thank uh, you. continuously cropping up. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jefferson, what other lessons should we draw from the fact that such a significant proportion of judges failed to abide by a clear statutory mandate to recuse themselves? Well, I'll pick up on the previous comments and say that this is a long-standing problem. At as I noted earlier, I don't think we want to be in a world where we rely on journalists to enforce judicial ethics, but that's what's happened here. Although, again, I think we need to welcome these kinds of investigations, and I commend the reporting. But that North Carolina Law Review study that was published in 2020, it documented, I believe, 200 um, instances that were similar where judges were hearing cases when they owned stock and parties. Um, there's a, a Law Review article I also cite in my written testimony that goes back to 2015, published in the Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics dealing with these issues too. And so they've been with us for a long time. Let me just point out one anecdote, though, that I think goes to my overarching theme, which is that we need to shift from a culture of silence to a culture of compliance. It was significant to me not only that the North Carolina Law Review published this information, but when the scholars thanked the research assistants who worked on it, one of those research assistants asked to be unnamed for fear of upsetting a judge. And I think we want a world where our judiciary welcomes it being brought to their attention if they're out of compliance with their ethics rules, not the, so that we can sanction and penalize our judges, but that so we can work together to make sure they are complying with all of their ethical obligations. And it's the concern about the intimidation for fear of upsetting a judge that has perpetuated in part the very problem that we're here today confronting. Thank you. When the journal reporters informed these judges of their violations, many relied on a variety of excuses, that they were unaware of the trades, that the recusal list had misspellings that were missed by the judiciary's conflict screening software, that their trades resulted in losses, or that they had a hands-off role in trading. I'm worried about what these judges' excuses reflect about the culture in the judiciary. Professor Jefferson and Mr. Well, you won't have time to answer within the five minutes, so I'll just limit it to Professor Jefferson. Do you think that judges 
see these kinds of failures as harmless or just simply being no big deal? I wouldn't want to presume to be in the mind of any of the judges and how they were responding. I can only take them at face value what they said in response to the reporters. And you've read the reporting as, as well. Some of them, it seemed, were not taking it seriously and did not think that it mattered or that the rule applied to them. Uh, I think that there are a, a few different tensions here. One is the fact that the American Bar Association's model code for judges has a different standard, and so perhaps some mistakenly thought the more liberal standard applied to them. But the reality is when Congress implemented 28 USC section 455, that bright line prohibition, it was very clear uh, what was intended, not only that judges not hear cases where they hold stock in parties or have a financial interest, no matter how small, but also Congress, in the legislative history, it reflects that they intended to have a higher standard than what the ABA had suggested in its model code. So it is incumbent on our federal judges to be aware of all of the rules that apply to them. And my hope is that through this hearing, through reporting like what we've seen, that we will be seeing a shift in the culture. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, I will next turn to uh, Mr. Bishop for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Jefferson, um, yeah, I, I generally agree with the notions or the recommendations and the thoughts you've laid forth in your testimony, uh, and particularly the notion of a culture of compliance. I do have some... As someone who practiced law for a long time, I didn't encounter judges that, that I thought were making decisions based on their financial interest. And this, this disclosure requirement or disclose anything or, or to, to deal with, you know, any financial interest, no matter how small, I think what happens is we end up giving the judiciary a black eye in a way uh, because uh, there's an, it's almost an, administra an administrative task uh, that doesn't really be belie any interest uh, and, and they're just not aware of it. And so it ends up looking like there's this massive noncompliance, which is unfortunate. But I also get why, and your article made clear, why there needs to be, why a per se, you know, uh, however small rule is out there. Uh, one, one question I had is I noticed that one of the things that's talked about in reform is whether or not to, to disclose all, publish all this information uh, the same way my financial disclosure statement is published on a website. Can you offer any insight why that was not done when this was originally, when this scheme was originally set up of judges having to disclose internally or, or you know, make the reports, but somebody's got to ask for them, like you said? I don't have particular knowledge about the thinking behind the process for disclosures that was adopted for the federal judiciary as compares to what you're required to do as a member of Congress, other than to note that the federal judiciary is not included in the same law that requires you to disclose in the way that you do. Um, and, and if I may, I, I do think, I, I do agree that um, this bright line rule will inevitably perhaps trip up someone who would have, as I said in my opening remarks, no actual bias in a case. But sometimes that's a trade-off we have to make right. in order to have these clear-cut rules for eliminating the perception of bias. That Thank makes you. some sense. But one of the things you advocate is that there be complete disclosure, publication of this, right? That they be published on a website, somebody could download it with anonymously and, and learn what the information is. Yes, yeah, so I do believe that publicly available information, um, in particular about recusals, that's my focus. So now in terms of uh, the... Um, How about the hol financial holdings? Yeah, in terms of the financial holdings, there, there may very well be reasons to um, limit the disclosure of that, but certainly not beyond the litigants and making it very uh, easily available and readily available. Another one of the big issues for litigants is because the federal judiciary now only files annually, you can have a case proceed for a whole year before someone will even know that the judge that they've been before had an interest, and that's if, of course, it's a judge who is actually disclosing as they should be. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk. I, I, I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, actually, I said in my experience, I didn't see judges that I thought were doing things for financial interest. On the other hand, my experience and observation has been that the most extravagant expressions of bias have been partisan bias, um, on the part of the bench. And I was just looking as we were sitting here, there was a, the Hill did a poll or reported a poll in 2018 that 66 percent of registered voters think that federal judges were influenced by politics or that their rulings were based more and more on their political interests. Uh, has there ever been any 
uh, uh, scholarship on the subject of whether judges, federal judges, are affected by ideology and whether that creates biases that they're not properly responding to. So I think it's, uh, well, recusal can apply beyond financial interest to be sure. And we should be concerned and thinking about any time a judge has an interest that hasn't been disclosed that is going to either actually prejudice the litigants before the judge or create the impression of bias. And so that can be financial interest. It can also be um, um, relationship-based. And in terms of partisanship, um, I, I, I read the, the same reports that the public absolutely believes that judges are driven by partisanship. Um, you'd think the federal judiciary would be somewhat um, immune from that since uh, federal judges are appointed and not elected as many of our state judges are. Um, but I don't have to tell this committee that uh, politics is, uh, surrounds appointments just as much as it also surrounds uh, elections. And uh, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of a difference, if we want to distinguish between, between these things, it, here, at least in this instance, we have individuals before judges and they have no idea that the judge has a financial interest in perhaps their opponent. So the information hasn't even been disclosed. If a judge is perceived as having a particular political viewpoint that is often um, or maybe more well known, uh, so that's one, I think, significant difference between what we're talking about here with respect to financial interest. At least it's not concealed is what you're suggesting. Exactly, yeah, and, and sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Um, My time's expired. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. We will now proceed to the gentleman from New York for five minutes, Mr. Nadler. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Jefferson, while judges owning individual stocks pose a problem under the Ethics and Government Act in Section 455, obviously, Judges are permitted to own mutual or index funds without having to accuse themselves. That approach would seem to avoid any public perception of impropriety because the public would rightfully not be concerned when judges do not know the companies in which they own stock. Why shouldn't federal judges be limited to owning uh, just mutual or index funds? I actually wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, that, that certainly would be one approach to handle this, uh, just as one approach is to prohibit own, owning a stock in a party that's in front of the judge deciding a matter. Another approach would be to require all judges when they come to the bench to divest of individual holdings and to hold mutual funds or the like. I, I, I would think that that would be a superior route because it's proven impossible despite the Stock Act and various other acts that we have passed uh, to enforce the law, whereas mutual, uh, requiring judges to own mutual or index funds, to put everything into mutual index funds, would be self-enforcing. Yes, and I'm, I'm certainly not a financial advisor, but I'm, I'm told that, that having mutual funds is still a wise investment. And so, uh, you know, in terms of uh, financial concerns that a judge might have that would dissuade someone who's well qualified from the bench from taking on that role, uh, that would be a, a, an effective option. Thank you. Uh, Mr. hedler Godet. this is Chairman Nadler. I'd like to pose a question to you. Uh, first of all, what do you think of the idea that I, we were just talking about of uh, requiring the judges uh, uh, put everything into a mutual or index fund? Thank you, Chairman Nadler. I think that would certainly be the cleanest way to address this issue, although as a reasonable intermediate first step, I think doing something like applying the Stock Act and requiring online posting of all financial disclosures of federal judges is a, is a perfectly reasonable um, way to go. And can you tell me whether the Wall Street Journal's reporting is the first time we've heard about judges failing to abide by the law governing recusals and ethics and financial disclosure? disclosure? And further, now that we have this reporting, is there any question that there, there are systemic problems that Congress and the judiciary need to address? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Chairman? Can you tell me whether the, the journal reporting is the first time we've heard about is the first time we've heard about judges failing to abide by the laws governing recusal ethics and financial disclosure? And and further, now that we have this reporting, is there any question that there are systemic problems that uh, Congress and the judiciary need to address? Uh, uh, no, that was not the first time uh, I had heard or we in the public had heard about those kinds of issues. And I think it absolutely points to a systemic widespread pervasive issue. Um, we often say that opacity plays midwife to impunity uh, in the good government community, and I think there's no 
there's no clearer emblem of that mantra than what happens in the federal judiciary right now. Thank you very much. Professor Green, uh, first of all, would you comment on uh, the idea of requiring uh, all federal judges uh, to put uh, any stocks they own into mutual or uh, index funds? So I don't have any specific comment on that proposal. Um, all I would say is that if the concern is about, you know, about being influenced by one's particular holdings, that might be um, a, a, a solution. But if the concern is that a holding might move markets in some way or something along those lines, it might be an incomplete solution. But um, this isn't something that I have a, a, a deep opinion about. Mm -hmm. And does the fact that the journal's reporting comes during an era of declining trust in our institutions add urgency to the need to address these problems? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's certainly, a, a, I think, a, a serious problem of uh, the perceived legitimacy of the courts, and this kind of reporting um, certainly doesn't help. And uh, given this context, what risk do we incur if Congress and the judiciary do not address the issues highlighted by, by the journal's reporting? Well, well the risk is, is continuing decline in the perceived legitimacy of the courts, which I think are affected by lots of things beyond um, individual financial uh, issues like, like, that, like, like, like what was reported in the journal, but this just, um, just adds to the problem. Thank you. And one issue that the journal's reporting was unable to determine was whether these judges' rulings were influenced by their own financial stakes in the case. But even so, these episodes obviously are problematic. Uh, Professor Jefferson, how would you respond to someone who said that because there was no evidence that a judge made a ruling in order to boost the value of his or her stock or sold stock before making a ruling that hurt the value of, the, of, of theirs, the, the misconduct unearthed by the journal actually is not particularly concerning? So I guess I have two comments to that. First, even if a judge is not actually biased in a particular proceeding, the appearance of it, there's a harm to those individual litigants uh, because they may not trust in the fairness of it, and then there's also a public perception harm in the legitimacy of the court. Um, but related to this, I would also say that in thinking about um, the, the perceived harm it's it's bigger than um, the the public perception and the individual harm to the litigants in that we have a law on the books that federal judges have not complied with. So if we don't think they should have to comply with this law because this law actually doesn't do anything about addressing either the actual harm to litigants or the appearance of harm to litigants because of their bias, then we should not have this law on the books. In the meantime, when it's there, uh, I mean, we, we all should follow our laws until they are changed or are appropriately challenged in our court system, right? But uh, if anyone should be following the law, I would think that the public would expect our judges to be following the law. Thank you very much. My time has expired and I yield back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question is for all, is, is there any of our four panelists that believe that judges, federal judges, should be above the law, as was alluded to by uh, 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 Ms. Jefferson? Hearing none, we'll assume that judges should, in fact, obey every law that they know to exist, and they should know to exist better than the average person in society. The second one, there was a lot of discussion in the openings in the testimony uh, of the constitutional question, and so I'm going to. Uh, I'll ask. Uh, I'll start with Ms. Uh, Ms. Jefferson. Our statutes that that have to do with disclosure and recusal do those exist for purposes of regulating the judges, or do those exist for protection of the individual's right to an impartial arbitrator? which is the actual right that is being protected? Yeah, so we, we're protecting the individual's right to due process and to a neutral decision maker. And in terms of uh, constitutional concerns about judicial independence or interference by one, between one branch and another, the Constitution, I think, is uh, very, very clear that it's within Congress's ambit to make the kinds of reforms that I've been proposing here. So following up on that, if, if what we're doing is protecting the individual, you, you've been saying, as have others, about the litigants. 
Uh, when it comes to the Supreme Court, when it comes to the appellate courts, and when it comes to the standard under which appellate courts second guess a federal judge in the original ruling, isn't it fair to say that in fact, everyone who might be affected by a precedent is in fact a person of standing? And I, and I say that because you alluded to the idea that well, maybe only the litigants would know, but if, if the Ninth Circuit makes a decision based on a case, it's gonna be binding I don't even get my day in court uh, when I go before a judge who might, in fact, come to a very different conclusion or a, steer a jury toward coming a different conclusion. So isn't there a broader right than just the litigant uh, or the defendant? Well, certainly in terms of wanting to ensure that the process is fair, right? So if the individual litigants are impacted by a judge's bias, you are absolutely right that the outcome, that decision, the decision that then governs all of us who are subject to it as precedent is not legitimate because it's a product of bias. And I guess lastly, uh, one of my great questions, is, is, and I, I'm gonna piggyback the full committee chairman, uh, I personally don't see any reason, even though I only have uh, uh, mutual funds and, and don't maintain individual stocks for the reason of conflict, I, I don't see a reason that we would effectively stop the lower courts but I'd like you to opine, and I'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, opine on the question of the Supreme Court, because ultimately those nine men and women, uh, without a recusal, the, the decisions are, are magnificently uh, dependent, and we have in my time here, 20 years in Congress, we have have justices who clearly had a background and a bias because of previous activities on a related case who chose not to recuse themselves. So do you feel that we have the right to demand recusal or a structure for a recusal? Yes, uh, Mr. Ice, I do. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the uh, it, it remains to be seen whether uh, Supreme Court will agree uh, and what they will do, but uh, I think that uh, the ideal solution is for the Supreme Court to voluntarily accept uh, uh, what is already a statutory uh, requirement uh, about uh, uh, adherence to the uh, uh, to 455 and uh, uh, their uh, that they voluntarily would agree to submit to the code of conduct for United States judges. Um, and whether additional obligations would be constitutional, I'd, uh, I recognize Professor Green as the real expert on the panel uh, on that question. Well, and I'll, then I'll go to Professor Green and ask the one final question, which is uh, if we withhold funding until or unless the Supreme Court returns with a standard to their liking, is that constitutional? Uh, I'd have to think uh, more, more I'd maybe think uh, more than I have uh, right now about the constitutionality of that uh, kind of, of threat. But as I sit here today- uh, By the way, I that's funding of the court, not funding of their salaries. <laughs> right, right. So their, their, their compensation can be diminished, but the, the Congress has quite a lot of control over the funding of the court. and. Uh, assuming it did not, it was went through proper legislative channels and, and was not uh, outside the legislative process in some way. Uh, I don't, as I sit here today, uh, see a constitutional issue with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to the gentleman from California, Mr. Liu, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I yield my time to you for whoever you want to yield your time to. The gentleman is kind and I appreciate it. Uh, recusal is also a problem with the Supreme Court. Justices' decisions whether to recuse or not can be inconsistent. Those decisions often go unpublished and there is no means of enforcing a failure to recuse. The decision to recuse or not cannot be appealed. Professor Green, you have written about proposals for reforming the Supreme Court. 
Should changes to the recusal process be included in any considered reforms to that body? I, I do think it's important to address the recusal uh, practices of the court. They're currently covered by the federal recusal statute, uh, 28 U.S.C. 455, but there are some special considerations with the court. Um, one is that it's uh, at least awkward and maybe constitutionally problematic for uh, for lower court judges to make decisions about whether the court should recuse, um, given that the court is uh, uh, superior in the constitutional hierarchy. And the other issue is that it's very uh, difficult to replace a Supreme Court justice, um, as there are only nine of them, uh, and you could lead to an even uh, court. So there are some important considerations, and there maybe have to be some modifications uh, when it comes to how to enforce a recusal um, statute against the court. But um, the, the lack of transparency um, is a is a problem, uh, I, I think, uh, and uh, I agree with uh, Professor Morgan that the standards that apply to other federal court judges um, should should apply in some fashion to the Supreme Court as well. Thank you, Professor. Does is there anything in Article Three or in Article One of the Constitution that would prevent Congress from directing the High Court, the Supreme Court? to bind itself to a code of conduct? So there's nothing specific within Article I or Article Three that would prevent Congress from doing that. Uh, part of the problem in this area is that Article Three is not very specific, and it doesn't say very much about what Congress can or can't do. Uh, Congress does have power under Article I, Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause, uh, to uh, make the rules that it thinks are necessary and proper uh, for uh, for the institutions of government to carry out their powers, and the court is one of them. So there's there's no specific prohibition. I think you would get some arguments, some sort of general separation of powers arguments about the court needing to be an independent institution, but uh, I don't find them persuasive in this area, uh, given how much Congress um, can and does regulate uh, the Supreme Court's behavior in other areas. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the journal rec reported a large number of trades by judges during cases in which those judges oversaw suits involving those same companies. Many of those trades netted the judges as much uh, as $50,000. Professor Jefferson, uh, why is this uh, such alarming cause for concern? Well, I think it goes back to the purpose of recusal, which is both for the individual litigants to feel that they have gotten due process, a fair process, and um, knowing that uh, a judge is making money off holding stock um, over one of the parties compromises that. And then, of course, the second purpose of recusal is the public perception. And I imagine that anyone in the public hearing this would find that uh, it diminishes how they hold our courts in esteem. So I think it's problematic for both of those reasons. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, there should absolutely be uh, restrictions, and I think we've touched on a number of those options in this hearing already, uh, one sort of clean way, as we've already discussed, it's just prohibiting prohibiting the ownership of individual stocks by federal judges. Um, you know, there are, other, there are other options to look at, too, of course. Um, as far as consequences, I think it, uh, it gets a little tricky uh, because we are dealing with, with a situation where judges have a lifetime appointment. Um, so there are just a few kind of ways to hold them accountable. And one of them, of course, is impeachment, but that's that's an, extreme, that's an extreme approach, and I suspect you all are not going to spend a lot of your time in Congress impeaching judges. Um, so I think the short answer to that is I think I don't have a good answer for you on what to do about consequences. So I think we do need to spend a lot more time thinking about what we can do to hold, hold federal judges accountable because, as we spoke to earlier, they ought not be above the law, and they certainly aren't, aren't above the law. Thank you. We will now turn to the gentleman from Texas, uh, well, let's see. Actually, Mr. Coleman is not here, so Mr. Well, I'm here. Comer's oh, here. Mr. Coleman, I didn't. 
Oh, okay. I did not recognize you. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I got you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. You are recognized. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> Mr. Morgan, um, you mentioned the 131 judges identified by the Wall Street Journal article that uh, represent, well, it is a minority of 870. It, of course, is quite concerning, but uh, that's probably, we're talk probably talking about a set of about a thousand people that were judges between 2010 and 2018. So it's a little more than 10%. That's still too many. But I was wondering um, if there was one action that you could take to bridge the gap so that we don't have that many judges who fail to report uh, potential bias, um, what would that uh, action be that you would recommend? Mr. Gomer, I think uh, the most, uh, the single most important is, uh, as I suggested earlier, that the clerk's offices around the country screen the cases as they come in before the judge ever sees them and uh, has access to the um, technical uh, capability to, uh, to not send them conflicting uh, cases in the first place. The second aspect would be that the judges, as others have suggested here, be required to report their trades uh, promptly. Uh, I think much shorter than the month or 45 days or all that are, are prescribed in some other statutes so that uh, they can be uh, uh, very timely in the, in the action. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm, pardon my not knowing, is there software that a clerk could utilize to make that check quickly, uh, like entering in the parties and seeing if there's a judge, is there software that can make that determination quickly? Well, there is software that is currently used by the administrative office that tries to do that, but it, and I am not an expert in that software, but it seems not to be uh, particularly effective if, if we have this many cases uh, that get through. Uh, so uh, I think you'd have to adapt the wide range of software that is available to law firms who are engaged in a very similar uh, checking operation every time a, a new client comes to the firm. So what I'm saying is I think that this is a solvable technical problem and uh, that uh, uh, if uh, we implement those uh, kinds of changes, we ought to be able to take care of at least the numbers which are, are, are shocking uh, at the moment. Well, if this software that's being used is what we're gonna tweak. I'm not sure I have enough confidence in that. Uh, it seems like there needs to be different software that would be utilized. And in view of the problems that uh, Director Mueller and Comey had with software at the FBI, I'm not sure about the federal ability to pick proper software. They can pick software that costs a tremendous amount of money, but we would need something that actually did what we needed done. And uh, I, I'm not impressed with the federal government's role in doing that. So anyway, uh, Professor Jefferson, are you aware of software that might be uh, more appropriate to use in the federal courts? I am not a software expert, so I don't have something to recommend. Um, but I would just say that we need something that certainly allows for better accountability, transparency, something that allows for the information to be more readily available to the public uh, on a, and to the litigants on a timely basis and at a, a, a low, if, if actually really no cost at all. Well, 
seemed like it was always cost, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence and I yield back my time. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now turn to the gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Stanton, for five minutes. All right, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Johnson. This has been a very informative hearing with outstanding uh, witnesses. Uh, I do appreciate many of the possible solutions to this dilemma, and it is a serious dilemma. It is critically important that the public have confidence in the judges that they may appear before and the judiciary as a whole. And this reporting by the Wall Street Journal is important and has shown that there are some gaps in that system. So I really appreciate you uh, organizing this hearing. With that, I will yield the remainder of my time to Congresswoman Ross. Thank you very much, um, Representative Stanton, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. The American Constitution was built on the promise of equal justice under the law, and our founders designed a judicial system that strives to administer blind, impartial justice. Every American is entitled to a free and fair trial presided over by a disinterested judge. The court's legitimacy depends on the public confidence of the people that people place in its ability to deliver this type of justice. Any shortcomings in our ethics systems for judges threatens this confidence. And recent reporting by the Wall Street Journal and in the North Carolina Law Review, and I'm a proud graduate of UNC Law School, um, has made clear the limit of the judiciary's present system of addressing conflicts of interest. We must act now to put checks in place to ensure that both real and perceived financial conflicts are avoided to restore the public's faith in our courts. And we cannot miss this opportunity to further transparency and ethical in integrity in the judicial branch. That's why, with my bipartisan colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, uh, I've introduced the Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act, along with Ranking Member Issa, with the chairman of this subcommittee and Chairman Nadler, among others. Our bill will ensure that judges face the same disclosure requirements as members of the legislative and executive branches. A double standard for the judicial branch is simply unjustified, and the transparency gap must be closed now. When elected officials breach the public's trust, the public has recourse at the ballot box. Article III judges, however, are appointed for lifetime terms. Given the tremendous amount of faith bestowed upon them, federal judges must be held to the utmost standards of ethical behavior and transparency. Our bill will also give the public access to judicial financial disclosures in an online searchable database. This will enable ordinary citizens to access these disclosures without impacting the confidentiality protections currently in place for judges' sensitive or private information. These me measures are common sense, bipartisan, and necessary immediately. Um, again, I'm Representative Ross from North Carolina, and Mr. Hedler Godet, um, I want to thank you for your testimony. Please tell us the relationship between the judiciary's transparency and its institutional legitimacy. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross, and I want to uh, thank you again for your leadership in introducing the bill you just spoke about. Uh, we, we at POGO are uh, happy to support it and uh, stand ready to help as it moves forward. Um, as for the relationship between legitimacy and the institutional integrity of, of uh, the courts, I think, it, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that without transparency in the courts, you cannot have legitimacy in the courts. Uh, we, as you noted, uh, we do not have the regularized accountability mechanism for the courts, that is election, that we do for you all in this committee room and that we do have for presidents and so on. We don't have those. What that means is that we need more and stronger, uh, more and stronger ways of holding people accountable in the judiciary and those are usually gonna come in the form of transparency requirements and disclosure requirements and things of that nature. So it, it seems preposterous that under the current system, Federal judges don't even have to comply with the standard that you all in this room have to comply with when it comes to disclosing financial information. 
at the very least, we need to operate on the principle of well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander here, and we need to get the federal judiciary to at least a place of parity when it comes to transparency. And I would, I would also posit that that's only the first step. We still have a lot of other things that need to be addressed within the judiciary when it comes to impunity, but this is a very reasonable, pragmatic, common sense first step, and I would um, I'd strongly encourage everyone in this committee room and everyone in Congress to support it. Thank you very much, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. We will now turn to the gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Fishback, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. And I just uh, uh, wanted to ask a couple of questions of uh, Professor Morgan. You know, we just, uh, Congresswoman Ross just mentioned her legislation, uh, and I'm, I'm a little concerned that, uh, you know, that the, the tension and the uh, things that are going on between holding the courts accountable and um, and actually the exposure to danger or the public uh, public information being released um, of the judges. And so I'm, I, it's my understanding that there has been some pushback that this may cause uh, issues for safety and uh, whatever the case for the judges and for their families. And so I'm wondering if that has been given any thought and um, if there's maybe more information that you might have on that issue. I don't have additional information on that issue, but I share the concern uh, that uh, uh, broad disclosure uh, that is uh, available to anybody uh, anywhere uh, in this country or, or around the world uh, is, is not uh, a value that, uh, uh, that has no limits. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, it is something that ought to be uh, taken into account as you formulate what the standard uh, really ought to be. And, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to take a look at the legislation that, uh, that Congresswoman Ross was talking about. It, are there any safeguards in that? Or if, if there haven't been, what kind of safeguards would you suggest? Well, I, I have not had a chance to okay. look at the legislation. But I would uh, suggest to you that uh, uh, the administrative office of the courts is a good source to uh, turn to to see what they have thought was important in the past in the in terms of protecting the judges who really are uh, uh, exposed uh, in some cases to to genuine danger. And Absolutely, and I appreciate that uh, that suggestion. And just um, just maybe just a little bit, um, you know, based on what you've heard today, because uh, both of, neither of us have had the opportunity to look at the legislation. But it, you know, are there? Do you really think that this will really change some of these proposals? Will really change the um, the behavior of the judges? Given that I think we've said a couple of times now, yes, uh, these things are in place, but they're just not doing them. And I'm wondering if you really think that this will have an effect, Professor. It's, it's very hard to predict, uh, of course, uh, what will actually have an effect, but uh, I, I think something uh, needs to be done. There's no question. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal stories in themselves, I suspect, have uh, gone through, uh, have, have created a response in the judiciary uh, that uh, uh, will cause them to be seriously concerned about uh, making necessary changes. Uh, my own view is that uh, this is not a controversial subject uh, or should not be, uh, and that the solutions uh, that you come up with ought to be ones that from my standpoint, ideally the court would impose on itself, uh, the court system would impose on itself through the judicial conference or some other institution such as that. Well, thank you very much, Professor. And um, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Would the Chair, general lady yield if you're finished? Oh, yes, I would yield to Congressman Issa. Thank you. Uh, following up on the general lady's questions, and, and I'll stay with uh, uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal got this information through publicly available documents, correctly? Yes, sir. Uh, they had to work uh, at it, uh, apparently. Uh, that is, it was not easy to gather the information, but they are publicly available. So when you look at you look at the proposal that 
Ms. Ross, the chairman, myself, and others are, are at least putting out there as a starting point, aren't we really saying that what is already gettable would simply be gettable in an organized and timely fashion? Well, I, I, I'm not certain, uh, Mr. Ice, I, I, uh, I, I accept your representation. Okay, well, let, in, instead, let's go to, wouldn't it be reasonable that if something is already available, that it be available in a reasonable and timely fashion and that that would not change the da danger uh, quote, quot quotient here? I agree with that point, absolutely. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, gentlelady. Thank you. We will now uh, resort to uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the uh, first, I want to thank you and, and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Um, notwithstanding your comments. As the arbiters of justice in our country, the impartiality of our judiciary should be beyond reproach. Justice and Supreme Court may be the most powerful people in our land because they are, decisions are not appealable and they've got lifetime appointments. Uh, they have control and actions over our bodies, particularly women's bodies, and our actions in so many ways. And yet they're not have any particular uh, ethical standards or restraints, and not bound by an ethical code of conduct. And that just seems wrong. Um, the whole idea of giving judges at all levels lifetime appointments is to get them free of any earthly desires right, any that they may fall prey to. Uh, and that they could be fair and impartial. But at the same time, uh, because they've got lifetime appointments, is, is, I've been hearing we can't really sanction them for violating any rules, which seems like a catch-22 of some, some nature. Hamilton correctly said the judicial branch has neither the power of the sword nor the purse. Uh, Professor Jefferson, what does the judiciary have to do to get parties to abide by any rules that they might set forth? Is there anything we can do to get the Supreme Court to take action? So Congress can require the Supreme Court to adopt a, a code of ethics. I think a really important point to make here, though, is um, so there's been a lot of conversation that we can't sanction the federal judges. But what I don't think any of us want to be sanctioning federal judges. What we want is compliance with ethics rules. And so the Supreme Court and the lower courts, the key to compliance is public accountability. And we can predict how the judges will respond because we saw how they responded when each one was, called, at least a lot of them responded, when they were called up by the Wall Street Journal and it was pointed out that they weren't complying with this law. Many of them followed up with litigants to let them know what happened. Many of them took steps to correct the situation. And so imposing that similar kind of accountability by um, not just requiring an ethics code, but then uh, showing how it's being complied with. So for example, not just requiring disclosure of one's finances, but maybe requiring disclosure of recusal decisions. If a judge is required to actually explain the basis for recusal, there are several important things that happen. One, there's accountability for that individual judge because he or she has to justify the decision to recuse or not recuse. But critically important, it becomes an education tool. Another judge thinks, oh, in a future case, I saw that a different judge recused. I should probably recusing too. And also for litigants, same thing. And that's wonderful. But what if they don't do it? What if they don't comply? What if they don't care? Well, your, your only penalty is shame. Yeah, and shame could be powerful. I mean, one of the points that I make in my written testimony, I said in my open shame statement. Shame doesn't is, exist anymore. Well, I think that that, that may very well be true, um, but it would at least get us closer to more judges adhering to the rules if we knew uh, there was a public list of judges who weren't complying. We at least now have more judges. So what are you going to do? They, 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 they don't lose their job. Well, true. They, I mean, they, can't, they don't lose their brokerage account. Taken to the extreme, so it would have to be impeachment, right? Yeah. Right. And we've seen how good that is. I understand. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, Mr. Hedler, uh, Gaudet, do you have any ideas about what we could do to try to make these, can we take away, give them a financial penalty? Can Congress have a law that says if they don't do it that they lose X amount of money for each uh, 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 failure to comply? Uh, thank you. So 
I think it's a bit beyond my expertise to say whether that would be that would be an appropriate avenue to take, although I would point out this is something that I also feel passionately about, that Congress does emphatically and unequivocally control the power of the purse. So there are a number of things, with the exception of reducing the salary of a federal judge or a Supreme Court justice, that you all can do if you were willing to more aggressively and assertively use the power of the purse around funding of, of facilities and that kind of thing. Professor Green, uh, you're out there somewhere, I guess. Uh, maybe not. Yes, here. Oh, I see you. There, there you go. Um, and the power of the purse. Uh, can we really do that? Can Congress uh, reduce the salary of a judge during their term of office? Isn't there some limitation on our reducing the salaries of judicial officials? Yes. So Article 3 says that the compensation of Article 3 judges can't be reduced uh, during their time in office. Uh, so that, that would be a limitation. Yeah. Uh, although other, other uses of the power of the purse uh, may, may not necessarily be limited in the same way. So well, take away their interns, the take away the their staff. Court, that sort of thing. Conceivably, it's never been tested, but um, but and there would be an argument about it um, that it would be resisted. But um, but there's no clear constitutional prohibition on that. No. All right, I'm over my time, and I've got other questions. I'll just put in writing. But I do want to make this comment: the Wall Street Journal story cited many judges. I don't think I knew hardly any of them except for the Sixth Circuit uh, Judge Julia Gibbons. I do not know, she's of a different political party. I don't know of a judge or a person that I've known who's more respected for her rectitude, for her probity, and the fact that she had, or her husband had some minimal amount of stock in some company that she may or may not have known about uh, is kind of absurd to think that would have affected her opinion whatsoever. So I say, you know, I understand disclosure and transparency, but I put Judge Gibbons over the Wall Street Journal any day. I yield back. I will now turn to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would yield my time to Mr. Issa. Thank, <clears throat> I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, I, I think we've we've reached a kind of an interesting point in the hearing where we're we're going to keep probing similar questions in different ways because I think we really need to know. Uh, or have your opinions, and so I'll, I'll go back to uh, Ms. Jefferson. Uh, if I'm summarizing what I keep hearing again and again, we we have 130 judges who, if on a, in a, I'm sorry, Mr. Cohen has left, but if in a timely fashion had be, been made aware, and the public was made aware of these failures under the existing statute most of them would have acted differently. Is that a fair statement based on what actually happened? I, I agree with that. And certainly the responses of many of the judges that were reported by the Wall Street Journal suggested that they were bringing themselves into compliance in real time. So the case for informing them and the case for making it public is pretty well documented based on the reaction of many of the 130. Is that correct? Yes. So I think we, we've gotten past that. Now, the question of enforcement is an interesting one. Uh, and, and, you know, whether someone recuses themselves even faced with that, uh, uh, I only have experience with lawyers who, seeing a client with a large amount of money, saw no conflict with having previously represented me on the other side um, and, and wanted me to waive their, their recusal. So. I know that at least among judges, which I understand is where you get, among lawyers, which I understand is where you get judges from, uh, there is a tendency to be reluctant to recuse. So one of the questions that is not in the bill that is, being, that is going to be considered at some point is a structure to enforce recusal at each level, including the Supreme Court. Would uh, you opine on whether or not you believe that we should be looking at a structure for third-party recusal, meaning, for example, and I'll just give the extreme one, there are nine justices of the Supreme Court. If there were a challenge to two of them based on some recusal item, should the other seven stand in, uh, in, in judgment of whether or not the recusal, or should it be continued to be left exclusively to the individuals? 
So I think that would be one important reform, and you can actually look to how that's worked in practice because we have our laboratory of states. So Texas, where I am a law professor at the University of Houston, the Supreme Court of Texas does exactly that. If one of the justices has some sort of conflict or there's a request for recusal, the other justices weigh in on that and evaluate whether or not, in fact, that justice should recuse. In addition to having, uh, and at the lower courts, it's not all of the, um, the district court judges, it's one that reviews for another. So um, the process needs to be, I think, scaled appropriately, depending on whether or not you're talking about the highest court or a lower court. The process needs to still happen in a timely manner. And there are, are other improvements or reforms that I would suggest in addition to not only having another judge review the recusal, also having the documentation of either why or why not a particular judge recuses is an important signaling mechanism. It's accountability for that judge, but it's also education for all judges and indeed parties going forward in the future whether or not it's appropriate for them to be seeking recusal. And following up on that, at the lower court, uh, as a matter of practice, in at least in the Southern District of, of California, there's an informal, I don't want a case, uh, but I don't want to say why, uh, that has historically happened where the chief judge will simply pass on somebody with a, a, without a reason uh, periodically. Often it's the complexity of the case, or in some cases, simply case load. Uh, do you think that that is an alternative for recusal that could be a tool for those who did not want to get in the specifics of recusal prior to the assignment of a case? I think it is, and the important caveat I would put in place is um, just with any reform, we want to make sure there's not unintended consequences. So you would want some protections in place, for example, to avoid litigants judge shopping, maybe put a limit on the number of recusals, that sort of thing. Well, having authored the pa patent pilot bill some years ago, I'm acutely aware that we want to we want to protect from there being only one judge that something goes through. Uh, lastly, the reforms that I just talked about and the others, if if before Congress even acts, if we encourage the court to uh, take action in any of these areas, including even the high court rep recusal uh, discussion we just had, is it within their power to do it? In your opinion, maybe you and Judge Mor or Mr. Morgan quickly. Uh, is that something that you believe they could do sua sponte? The court itself? Yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, I wish the federal judiciary had already done it, and um, maybe they will in light of this hearing and this latest report. We'll see. If not, it falls to you. Does anyone disagree with their ability to do that uh, of their own accord? I agree, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will now turn to the gentlelady from North Carolina, uh, Ms. Ross, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to share some information with the committee um, relative to uh, Representative Fishbach's question. Um, I know that many members of the committee have not yet had a chance to see the legislation that we've introduced, but I want you to know that the bill does not impact existing judicial safety and confidentiality rules. Um, under the Ethics and Government Act, which this bill amends, the immediate and unconditional availability of a judge's disclosure is not required if a finding is made by the judicial conference that revealing personal and sensitive information could endanger that individual or a family member. Further, um, and what happens far more often in practice, is that discrete details in a judge's disclosure may be redacted in order to protect the individual who filed the report or a family member of that individual. And the Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act keeps this provision in place. So I'm hoping that that will um, smooth the road for the bill when it comes back to committee for a markup. Um, Professor Green, um, first of all, I want to thank you for staying with us. I know you had a previous engagement, and we really appreciate you staying with us for this afternoon because um, you've shed a lot of light on what our authority is and, um, and how we can act consistent with the necessary and proper powers. I'd like to ask you, would a publicly available online database of judicial financial disclosures fit within the historical pattern of promoting uh, transparency and ethics in the courts? Yes, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, Congress has regulated the ethics of lower federal courts for almost the entire time 
they've existed uh, back into back back going back to the 18th century. Uh, and I think this is entirely consistent with that constitutional power. Thank you very much. And um, Professor Jefferson, um, you've talked a lot about changing the culture and how we can change rules that would affect effectively change the culture. Um, in addition to making changes in the law, do you think it would be good to have regular ethics training for our judges? Well, I, absolutely. As a legal ethics professor, of course, I'm an advocate of regular ethics training, although I'm mindful that that alone is not enough. Uh, in fact, I think professional responsibility is a required course in all law schools post Watergate, but we still have lawyers who find themselves and judges, as it turns out, violating uh, ethics obligations, which is why I think um, an important education tool, in addition to like a continuing legal education seminar, is the public education and the education to the judges themselves when they have to publicly release information on a regular basis. And um, you also um, have said, and I just want to basically make you repeat what you've said to some of the other folks, including um, my colleague, um, Representative Issa. How would the transparency of publicly available and searchable financial disclosures encourage the culture change that you've advocated for? Well, we've been able to see it in real time. Uh, but I think rather than having journalists create that transparency, it would be better served for the judiciary itself to create that transparency. When information becomes publicly available, judges who aren't following the rules, either because they don't know about them or just because they think no one's going to check and see if they are, um, will, will come forward and, and change their behavior. And maybe it won't change everyone, but um, I think that it um, absolutely shifts the culture from one of silence where we just don't talk about it because we don't know or because we think silence connotes respect into a culture where we're coming alongside not to sanction but to actually bring ourselves into compliance with our ethical obligations. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you. I want to thank our distinguished panel of experts for your testimony today and for your time. Uh, this concludes the first panel for uh, today's hearing, and we will now transition to the second panel. And while we do that, we will be in recess for five minutes. Good afternoon, Judge Elrod. Could I get a quick audio test?
I will now introduce the witness on our second panel. Judge Jennifer Walker Elrod has served as a circuit judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in Houston, Texas since 2007. She was recently appointed chair of the Judicial Conference Committee on Codes of Conduct, which provides advice on the application of the Code of Conduct for U.S. judges, including financial conflicts and recusals regarding financial disclosures. Prior to joining the federal bench, Judge Elrod was a state trial judge in Texas and worked in private practice. Judge Elrod clerked for the Honorable Sim Lake of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas and earned her B.A. from Baylor University and her J.D. from Harvard Law School. Welcome, Judge Elrod, and thank you for participating in today's hearing. I will repeat my other, my earlier reminder that your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalties of perjury pursuant to 18 U.S.C. Section 1001. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety, and accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes, and to help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table, or there's a timing light on, on uh, the uh, screen, and uh, when that light switches from green to yellow, you will have one minute to conclude your testimony, and when the light turns to red, it signals five minutes have expired, and with that, uh, Judge, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you the work that the federal judiciary is doing to promote judicial ethics and transparency. My name is Jennifer Walker Elrod and I serve as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. On October 1st, 2021, I became the chair of the Committee of the Codes of Conduct of the Judicial Conference of the United States. Judicial ethics and transparency are fundamental to an independent judiciary, and they're fundamental to the public's trust in the judiciary. Litigants must be confident that they will have a fair and impartial forum to bring their cases. Accordingly, the judiciary takes these matters very seriously and is greatly concerned when lapses occur. My message today is first, the judiciary has strong ethics frameworks in place including the recusal statutes, the code of conduct canons, and the regulatory policies of the judicial conference described in my written statement. Those are powerful tools and resources available to the federal judiciary and to the public to ensure the functioning of an ethical and independent judicial branch. Second, the committee on codes of conduct supports that framework through providing advice and extensive training. I'll speak more about that in a moment. Third, courts are working to review and work with parties to address the specific cases where recusals did not occur. Fourth, the judiciary has, is already uh, involved in additional training and technology improvements. Particularly, we have begun additional training for all judges focused specifically on conflicts checking. Further, circuit councils, courts throughout the country, and the Committee on Codes of Conduct are all working together to review our systems to identify improvements, best practices, and additional procedures that could eliminate lapses in the future. Fifth and importantly, transparency is essential to the integrity of the judicial branch and the public's trust in the judiciary. That is one reason why the federal courts have public proceedings, even, even during this COVID era, and why we issue written opinions. It is also why the Committee on Codes of Conduct publishes its advisory opinions. One of the purpose of the Committee of Codes of Conduct is to help judges work through ethical issues ahead of time so that they don't make mistakes. The committee provides ethics training and advice to federal judges throughout the country. For example, at the request of my chief judge, I have personally provided training to the circuits judges in my circuit just this month on conflicts issues. We also provide confidential guidance to judges and publish advisory opinions to inform both judges and the public. In addition to training improvements, the Judicial Conference, the Committee on Codes of Conduct, and the circuits are working on technological improvements to help better manage conflicts. 
Judges already use conflict screening software. Both the individual circuits and the Committee on Codes of Conduct are collecting best practices for using the conflict checking software, and our staff are looking for possible additional improvements. The Eighth Circuit has helped spearhead this effort. Recent media reporting on financial interest conflicts has highlighted gaps that we can address through training and technological improvements. While the number of cases with reported lapses is small compared to the total number of cases that we handle, we must strive to achieve full compliance. As I often tell my law clerks, each case is important and deserves our utmost attention. For litigants, a case may be the most important thing in their life. In fact, it may even be a, member, a matter of life and death. Therefore, it is essential that litigants believe the judges who hear their cases will be impartial. The judiciary's goal is full compliance with ethics and reporting requirements. The committee and I will work tirelessly to meet this goal. You have my word. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. We will now turn to the gentleman from California for five minutes, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And your Honor, uh, one of the challenges that I think uh, we face here is we hear you, we know that your intentions are good, but uh, just using, I'll use Texas for an example. Uh, we had a judge in East Texas who had very obvious conflicts of interest as he handled more patent cases uh, with family interest and family financial benefit for many years, and there was no action taken by the court. Uh, we now have uh, a judge in West Texas who has made a cottage industry out of a massive amount of cases, and we are still waiting to see his financial disclosures even filed, or at least made available. Uh, can you tell me how we can get compliance with existing law so that we can have better confidence? Uh, and, and when I say compliance, I mean uniform and complete compliance, because we know that you, you do well 80% of the time, but of course the interest is in the 20% that we don't see. Well, you're talking about compliance, yeah. two different areas. Uh, one is in financial disclosures, which is um, one bucket, and that's uh, the financial disclosures process is under the jurisdiction of the Committee of Financial Disclosures. And then you're talking about recusal checks, and that's under the, um, the, the committee that I chair now. And it's very important that judges be trained fully on what their recusal uh, obligations are. We learned uh, recently, for example, that judges had some confusion in this regard. Um, the judges thought separately managed accounts, some judges did, not many, but if you have any, that's gonna cause a problem. Thought separately managed accounts were the same thing as mutual funds. Well, mutual funds have a safe harbor under our ethics guidance and separately managed accounts are considered to be controlled funds, which do not have a safe harbor. Sure. So no, we're doing- And, and your honor, I appreciate that. Uh, I was thinking, uh, for example, if you do not see, if you're, if, you're not, if, if you're not able to review financial disclosures and they're not being produced in a timely fashion, then how do you provide guidance for those who likely should recuse? In other words, today, neither you nor the financial disclosure separate organization uh, have a timely requirement uh, to consider recusals and the necessary information to, in fact, make a case-by-case -case decision, meaning you're not in a position to tell somebody, hey, you did have that separately managed but, uh, item, and, oh, by the way, uh, you should have recused yourself because, one, the, the compliance is limited, but uh, in the reporting, but then secondly, that's not part of, uh, if you will, a case review that you or some other part of uh, the, the third house does. Well, with regard to ethics conflicts checking, uh, each judge has to keep a list of his or her recusal interest. And that's not just financial interest, that's other interest as well. And then those have to be shared uh, with the with the required conflict screening uh, people in their in their clerk's office. 
so that those can be done electronically. So there is a requirement that those lists be maintained. To the extent though, I, I hear you, I, I think that you have concerns about the financial disclosure reports, which again, uh, is a completely different system. But, and but your, not, your, Honor, your Honor, not to sorry. interrupt you, but the time is very limited. Oh, of, sure. course, of course, a lot of what we're talking about is financial disclosure, but we're really talking about since the court has not created an ability to second guess the judges uh, and to have the information and to make sure the information is being delivered in a timely fashion, uh, you know, it's one of those, if you will not act, how can we not feel it necessary to create a series of laws that cause you to react in a way that is more than just hoping that a judge who is perhaps confused, perhaps is misinformed, simply uh, doesn't do that. And I gave you the example, first of East Texas, now of West Texas, and I deliberately didn't mention names, but these judges have become notorious for basically where patent cases go. And if they have financial conflicts or prejudices, uh, the fact is they've made no effort to recuse themselves, not once. Well, uh, Mr. Issa, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on any particular circumstances regarding any particular judges. But I would say that there is a system for disciplining judges that don't comply with our conflicts checking regulations. The and if, code, you, code, if you so if you'd code, provide I'm to sorry. us a list of any judges that have been disciplined for the record, I would appreciate it. My time's expired, and uh, I don't want to be unfair to the uh, chairman, but if you'd provide us the, a list of any discipline so that we can review that and, and see whether it's proportional. I, I can't come. Thank you. Um. When the journal reporters ask the judges they profiled why they failed to recuse themselves from cases on which they had a clear financial conflict of interest, several of them blamed the judiciary's conflict checking software. That simply cannot be a valid excuse. Aren't judges responsible for knowing what stock they and their spouses hold and taking the necessary steps to avoid hearing cases that they must re recuse themselves from? Chairman Johnson, judges are responsible for maintaining um, a list of all their financial holdings and being knowledgeable about their financial holdings, as well as the holdings of their spouse and minor children. So that is the judge's responsibility at all times. The bottom line is this, if we cannot assume that judges are doing something as basic as checking whether they own stock in a party in a case before them, Congress may need to act. For example, should Congress require that judges affirmatively state that they have checked whether they have to recuse themselves from a case and then impose penalties for noncompliance? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congress, um, I know that I, I can't speak of what Congress is doing, but I can tell you what the courts are doing. We are making sure that the judges know they have these obligations. We're making sure that we don't have gaps in our software and that these checks are performed at the very instant uh, of the case coming to be and then are repeated uh, should the parties change or some financial person's, uh, some person's financial circumstances change. So we are making sure, and, and as I mentioned before, uh, judges who do not follow these policies, um, which are policies of the judicial conference that all judges check and participate in this, uh, can, can, face, um, can face discipline from the, um, from the judicial council and the chief judge in their circuit. Um, and so can you commit to providing the committee pursuant to uh, uh, Congressman Issa's request a uh, list of um, actions that the conference has taken uh, with respect to holding judges accountable for failing to recuse, um, failing to report? I cannot commit to providing that list, but I certainly will make an inquiry about that. The problem with that is that uh, judicial con um, conduct matters 
are uh, confidential while they're on, ongoing. Sometimes um, they can give a public reprimand or something upon the conclusion of them, but if a, a proceeding is ongoing, that is generally considered a confidential um, confidential uh, proceeding. But we can follow up with the. Uh, well, yeah, the just conference. simple numbers. I'll follow, of, up with the, I'll follow up with the conference on what could if be provided. Um, Thank you. A handful of proactive judges have taken the initiative to post their own recusal lists or versions of that information online in their local courthouse websites. I applaud them on taking those steps and showing that they take their responsibilities seriously. Shouldn't every judge simply be required to post recusal lists online? Well, there's some problems with the requirement to post recusal lists online. First, recusals are not um, only about finances. Um, one reason for recusals might be personal relationships, uh, either or even animosity between parties and the judge uh, and the, or the judge's family. And disclosing such relationships could uh, harm the privacy of third parties. But also, and very importantly, but publishing these types of lists could lead to forum shopping. Uh, you, we're all aware of situations where people hire particular lawyers because they think someone's going to be recused or sue a particular party or uh, bring them in. Um, so there are concerns about forum shopping and privacy interest of third parties that would be affected by those types of lists. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we'll now turn to the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Judge, for being with us and for taking on um, quite a heavy load dealing with judicial ethics. And so we appreciate both your time with us and your time um, away from the bench um, dealing with your, your fellow judges. Um, we understand that the judiciary has not made judges' 2019 annual disclosures publicly available in, a, in response to a request for all disclosures. Um, why does it take so long for the information to be available, and could this lag prejudice a litigant who has grounds to request recusal due to a conflict of interest? Thank you, Congresswoman Woman Ross. Um, First of all, I just want to reiterate that the financial disclosure process is under the uh, jurisdiction of the Committee of Financial Disclosure and is in a totally separate system than the recusal system. One is a transparency measure and one is a recusal uh, judicial ethics measure. Um, and but, but I did want to say that it's my understanding that the reason these reports have taken a long time, and I agree with you that they have taken a long time is that they undertake a lot of these preparations of these um, disclosures that they get so many thousands of requests for disclosures and they do a lot of the preparation by hand. Um, however, it's my understanding that the judiciary in, in, in that group, that committee, is developing and implementing a new electronic financial disclosure system, which will include features for filing and features needed for releasing the reports to the public on a more timely basis. Obviously, technology can help the judiciary in this area. Uh, we can do so many more things um, using technology than uh, by hand painstakingly go through these reports. Obviously, the interests are improving the timeliness of response to these requests to review reports, while also taking into account the serious security concerns with the increasing availability of personal and sensitive information available about judges online. But I do believe that um, the judiciary is in the process of um, automating this process with the goal of include proving the timeliness. Thank you. I can't hear you. Uh, I'm, I'm so Walker. sorry. Um, to my second question, could the lag prejudice a litigant who has grounds to request recusal due to a conflict of interest? Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not familiar with the process of using financial disclosures for recusals in cases. Um, I would hope that um, 
that the judge that the judge, if they had a financial interest, would recuse. Um, and if they didn't, as I said, they could be subject to discipline. I, I would hope that we would make sure that we are complying with all our obligations. I believe um, in general, I believe judges are conscientious and are doing um, and are trying to get these things out. These um, And also, I believe that judges care about not sitting on cases that they're not supposed to sit on. Um, okay. And so yeah. I think that they would, I, I believe that judges are conscientiously trying to do this, but of course there have been some gaps that have been identified. Okay. Um, judges are currently notified when requests for copies of their financial disclosures are made, including the identity of the requesting party. Could this have a chilling effect on whether a litigant makes such a request? And without this information, how can a litigant ensure that the judge hearing the case does not have a conflict of interest? Again, um, I don't deal with personal financial disclosures. I haven't studied that issue. I would hope not. Judges are, um, as you pointed out earlier, we have um, we have judicial independence, and we um, we should recognize that some people will want to know information about us. Um, I used to run for office and in in Texas and, and people want to know information about judges. People want to know information about um, uh, federal judges, um, information that doesn't damage our security or our well-being or those of others or impact third parties' security interest um, or privacy interest. People are going to want to know and I don't think the judges should hold that against uh, litigants. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now turn to the gentleman from New York, the uh, chairman of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Elrod, thank you for testifying today. I'd like to ask you a similar question to one I posed to the first panel. It seems that many of the difficulties with financial disclosure and recusals could be avoided if judges and their close family members were restricted to holding only mutual or index funds. Would that solve this problem? Not only by eliminating the appearance of impropriety, but also making things easier on individual judges who would no longer have to keep track of all their investments before they take on a given case? Well, Chairman Nadler, I agree with you that holding mutual funds does simplify the process for judges. Um, as we indicate in our guidance to judges, um, mutual funds can ordinarily be a safe harbor for judges, uh, and they simplify the processes for judges. So. Do I think that it uh, would solve every problem regarding recusal? Um, certainly not, because um, there are broad and mandatory financial recusal provisions that deal not only with stock holdings, but with any financial interest, and then also the, all of the other types of reasons that judges have to recuse that don't involve finances at all. Um, but it is true that although a judge is permitted to own stock, the recusal statute and the code also discourage judges from having financial interests, stock or otherwise, that might lead to frequent recusals. The codes of conduct state specifically that as soon as the judge can do so without serious financial detriment, the judge should divest investments and other financial interests that might require free, frequent disqualification. So judges need to be mindful of all of these decisions when they're considering what should be in their portfolios or considering their spouse or their I, minor I, children. Excuse me, I don't understand your answer. Um, if we required that judges uh, have everything in a mutual or uh, index fund, why wouldn't this solve all the problems we're talking about? It would call, it would help with some fin with the financial recusal issues, some of them, except for any other type of financial interest that wouldn't be a stock-based mutual fund interest. Yeah, you could hold um, real property, other types of interests and things, mm -hmm. not everything. But as far stock as stocks are concerned, yes. it would be a, a solution. Um, well, I keep my funds in a mutual fund because I find that it's much more, it's easier to handle as a judge. Thank you. I, I've been surprised to learn that some of the guidance provided to judges about how to comply with the Ethics and Government Act is not made publicly available. 
For example, neither the public nor Congress can see copies of the instructions that judges are given for filling out the financial disclosure forms. This is in contrast to Congress and the executive branch, both of which make their instructions publicly available. Do you know why all judiciary guidance documents uh, for financial disclosures are not made available to the public? And is this something that the Judicial Conference is planning to revisit as part of its response to the Wall Street Journal investigation? Congressman Nadler, I do not know the answer to that question. I don't work on financial disclosures and I'm not familiar with the guidance documents of their, and their publicity. I know financial disclosures as a judge who must complete them annually. Okay, and uh, a common response from the judges who were asked by the journal about their failures to recuse was they did not know they were required to recuse under the circumstances, either because the investments in question were held by a spouse or were managed by a money manager. Both circumstances that fall squarely within the recusal statute. This seems like a failure in part of training. How does the Judicial Conference plan to redress this going forward? Um, Congressman Nadler, as I indicated earlier, we have already begun training specifically on these issues. I conducted such training uh, for my circuit judges uh, already this month. We are going to have continued training through the end of the year and beyond but we're going to be having a, a significant amount of training on this very issue. We don't want any judge to be ignorant of the rules regarding financial holdings. It's very important because judges are ultimately responsible for their financial holdings. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentle lady from North Carolina is again recognized for uh, five minutes. Well, thank you for your generosity, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Elrod, um, I'd like to read from um, a statement from Ms. Sherry Cheshire, um, whose husband, Jim, died of mesothemiona, I can't say it, mesothemiona, and um, whose wrongful death suit was effectively ended by a judge who owned at least $15,000 worth of shares in each of the two defendants um, that in that case. And the judge's financial conflicts were disclosed by the Wall Street Journal. Um, Ms. Cheshire wrote uh, to the chairman, um, and I quote, to learn this now three years after our case ended is like reopening a painful, painful wound. wound. I, I always knew that no lawsuit would ever bring Jim back but I did feel that getting justice would, in some way, honor Jim and his service to our country, of which he was always so proud. To now learn that we were never going to get justice because the judge had a financial interest in two of the companies responsible for Jim's death is a shock and a devastating disappointment. I thank you for the opportunity to be heard, and I know Jim thanks you, too, for hearing him." End quote. Ms. Cheshire's statement shows that the effect of a judge's failure to recuse isn't abstract or hypothetical. It's real. The appearance of unfairness causes real pain to the parties who come to our court seeking justice. Uh, what would you say to Ms. Cheshire in response to her written mm -hmm. statement? Congresswoman Ross, I cannot respond about any particular situation regarding any judge and their recusal uh, obligations that, um, so I cannot respond in particular. But as I stated in my opening statement, it is crucial for the integrity of the judiciary that we make sure that we comply with our ethical obligations, both um, both to avoid impropriety, but also to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Litigants need to know that they have judges who will fairly, just fairly hear their cases. Would the gentlelady yield? I yield. Thank you. I, I just want to ask you, um, in, the in, in, the, in, in, the, in the kind of a case that uh, was just referred to, where it is de demonstrated, uh, assume the facts. It's demonstrated that someone was uh, uh, not treated fairly because of a conflict of interest uh, by the judge. Uh, what can be done to right that? 
Well, um, the clerk's offices have written to, and again, I'm not speaking about any particular case, but I know that the, uh, the judges have instructed the clerk's office to notify uh, the litigants if they participated. And then the litigants may have um, opportunities to pursue other avenues about the cases. Uh, it depends on the individual case. I could not comment on any pending case or any particular outcome, but they could pursue, um, litigants in general could pursue case, uh, pursue um, things to open their case or to pursue different avenues regarding in the court system for their case. But also, um, as again, I've mentioned earlier, the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980 um, provides ways that judges in the Judicial Council of each circuit can um, a, a deal with judges who, who don't obey the rules. But again, I'm not talking about any particular or real world situation. Hey, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. I yield back to her. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, about the conflict checking software that I understand is built into the case management electronic <coughs> case files or CM slash ECF system that the courts use for all court business. That system has gone largely unchanged for almost two decades. It has been criticized by a range of experts as unfit for the business of the United States courts and it has proven itself vulnerable to external security risks. Many, most modern conflicts checking software catches even misspellings and close variations on names, but CM slash ECF cannot. I fear that CM ECF is really not up to the task of screening for financial conflicts. It's supposed to be a fail safe a resource of last resort when judges' individual personal conflict checks fail. In response to the journal's reporting uh, of exposure of the widespread failures of that system to operate as intended, does the Judicial Conference or the Administrative Office have any plans to update CM ECF so that it is better suited to fulfilling its critical role, and if so, can you describe what those plans entail and when the public can expect to see those plans implemented? Judge Elrod. Chairman Johnson, our, um, we have a new a next gen CM ECF that also works with our conflict checking software. Our conflict checking software can um, check misspellings um, if it if it's set for that, it can check it can, it can check miscapitalizations, uh, spaces between words. Our conflicts checking software can work at a very um, you know it's a, at a very high level of checking for those things if the if it's set for those levels. Now the you know there's a tension between you don't want to overset an automated software that might over recuse. Um, based upon similar named parties and things like that. But at the same time, you want to make sure you catch them all. And so one of the things that we are actually working on right now is determining what are the best practices for what the settings should be, and then communicating those throughout the districts in the United States. And I think that's a, that's a very important project that can be done um, fairly swiftly. So the judges who blamed their failure to recuse on the software, uh, what is your explanation for that? Chairman Johnson, I'm not here to speak about any particular judge's situation or his or her explanation. I'm here to talk about what I have learned about improvements we can make in the judiciary. And one improvement we can make is that we make sure that everything, that every check is done before a case is assigned and that the software is set so that it does capture misspellings, miswords, capitalization issues, things like that. And so um, those are things that can be improved and can be improved quickly. 
Thank you, Judge Elrod. We appreciate your testimony today and for your patience uh, throughout this uh, hearing. And with that, uh, our hearing is adjourned. Thank you uh, once again to all of the witnesses for appearing today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.